This is Yamabuki, who's got it all. Looks, wealth, girth, you name it. But as perfect as the Riz Master's life may seem now, Everything. his childhood was one of solitude and emptiness. The only solace he found was in the voice of a radio host known as Apollo. However, one day, Apollo stopped broadcasting without explanation. Just like my dad. Years passed, and Yamabuki entered high school. Yet his quest to find Apollo persisted. Despite not knowing her appearance or real name, he's certain she's a part of the school's broadcasting club. The problem? There are four girls in the club, and they all sound just like Apollo. Something huge is happening at this Japanese high school. The Furin Girls High School merged with the Boys High School, and it's their very first day of class. <clears throat> There's teenage tension in the air, and everyone is fidgeting and side-eyeing each other. The teacher breaks the awkward silence by instructing everyone to introduce themselves. That's when our boy slams the table to make sure that everybody knows he's the main character of this manga. Besides, as the heir of the Yamabuki group, one of the biggest conglomerates in Japan, it's only fitting that he go first. Without further ado, Yamabuki commences a speech in front of his classmates. Yes, he acknowledges his outward perfection, but even he, the great Yamabuki, has his flaws. So to make up for his shortcomings, he invites all the girls in the class to chant, I love you to him. After that disaster of an introduction, the class becomes even more divided between the boys and the girls. Yamabuki's classmates get enraged at him over ruining their opportunity to get friendly with the girls. But honestly, Yamabuki couldn't give less of a fuck about their peasantry concerns. Suddenly, a speech bubble interrupts their conversation. The owner of said bubble offers herself as Yamabuki's girlfriend, so she can help fill the 1% he's missing. However, she's clearly a side character, so let's move on from her desperate attempt to claim any relevance in this manga. Besides, it's time for Sir Yamabuki to attend to a more pressing matter, the call of nature. Apparently, even his digestive tract is perfect. It operates with such precision that it's more accurate than a Swiss watch, meaning he poos exactly at the same time every single day. Personally, there's not a superpower I'd like more than that. Anyway, some of the boys meeting Yamabuki for the first time get puzzled by his demeanor. So his former classmates explain that Yamabuki has always been that way. Ever since they've known him, he's been searching for one particular girl, yet he doesn't even know what she looks like. All he knows is her voice. Now let's do a brief flashback to understand what's really going on. This is Yamabuki at the age of 12. Every day he used to listen to a radio show hosted by a girl known as Apollo. Her show wasn't all that popular, but for Yamabuki, it was the only source of joy and meaning in life. And because she had such few listeners, Yamabuki was often able to have one-on-one -on -one phone conversations with her. And Apollo used to always finish her broadcast by saying, I love you. Holy shit, who's that? Judging by an entire page dedicated to her first appearance, her existence must matter. And the way that necktie hangs in the air, it's making me regret not paying attention in physics class, because I'd sure like to measure the size of those yogurt producers. Anyway, she just walks away from Yamabuki afterwards. Before he can stop her to inquire about her identity, Yamabuki's digestive system signals for an incoming missile. So he hobbles to the bathroom in order to keep it clenched and airtight fearing the biohazard he might unleash in the hallway. Some time passes and it's lunchtime, yet Yamabuki's thoughts remain fixated on his encounter with the girl earlier. He's not sure if she's Apollo, but their voices were undeniably similar. But Apollo's broadcast was over three years ago, so her voice is somewhat hazy in his memory. His thoughts are interrupted by the broadcasting club with their noon announcement. Having attended a boys-only school their entire lives, the boys get rowdy hearing a girl's voice through the broadcast system. Meanwhile, Yamabuki is either shocked or he senses a second missile on the way, which maybe got delayed while turning a corner in Yamabuki's intestine. Anyway, he books it out of the cafeteria without offering any explanation. As he makes his way, we're provided with some more details about Apollo. What Yamabuki has been able to gather so far is that Apollo is in the same grade as him and lives in the same city. Previously, Apollo expressed a desire to attend an all-girls high school by the sea. That's how Yamabuki connected the dots to figure out which high school she attends, the high school he's in now. In fact, 
That's the only reason why a princeling like himself is attending a public high school. Anyhow, Yamabuki finally arrives at his planned destination, the broadcasting room. With his heart pumping madly, he kachaks the door open. Immediately, he's met with all eight plots of this manga, although the two at the back remain somewhat hidden from our view. Yamabuki makes a courteous apology for the interruption, but one of the girls screams at him, which ends up getting broadcasted to the entire school. So they promptly mute their mics and continue confronting our boy. There, now we get the full view of the eight plots of this manga. Honestly, I don't know if it's the sheer size of the plots, or this public high school is so underfunded that they don't even have proper size t-shirts for their students. But either way, I'm just grateful. Anyway, Yamabuki realizes he's in a sticky situation. Yeah, the girl he met in the hallway sounds like Apollo, but so do the other three girls. Now that can only mean that he's gonna have to get to know all four of them individually. Wait, is this evolving into a harem manga? If so, hell yeah, you guys. Okay, but these girls aren't here just to provide plots for this manga. Just like how their plots are of different shapes and sizes, their dreams and aspirations are also different, which is why they all joined the broadcasting club. She wants to be an announcer. Her dream is to be a full-time VTuber. She's an aspiring actress. And the girl Yamabuki met in the hallway wants to be a singer. Meanwhile, all I'm thinking right now is how I'd like to star in an isekai manga called That Time I Got Reincarnated as a Necktie. Anyway, let's go for another flashback. Yamabuki recalls one of Apollo's shows where she revealed her dreams. At the time, she considered four different career paths, voice actor, announcer, singer, and VTuber. So yeah, that doesn't help us at all in narrowing down who Apollo is among these four girls. So back to the present moment. I think it's about time we stop being rude and learn their names. The straight-haired girl's name is Uzuki. She's my personal favorite. The pigtailed girl is Nene. I'm really into how she looks down on you, so my teeth are tightly clenched as I write this. Next up is Kirino, the one aspiring to become a VTuber and wears a hood. She makes me clench my teeth, too. Last but not least, we have Rika, who Yamabuki encountered in the hallway earlier. Rika has her hair braided to the side in a typical anime mom hairstyle, which makes me worried that she might soon find herself isekai'd. Anyway, Yamabuki doesn't spare a second to ask who among them is Apollo. Alas, it's not going to be that easy. None of them appear to know who Apollo even is. But if there is one thing Yamabuki is certain about, it's that one of them is definitely Apollo. That also means Apollo is concealing her identity for whatever reason. No matter, though, now that he has it narrowed down to these four girls, he thinks it's only a matter of time before he uncovers Apollo's identity. Oh, by the way, the girls at the broadcast club have a huge female fan base. Swiftly, Yamabuki shuts the door before he becomes the protagonist of a one-shot manga. Even if he manages to survive, though, this may be the very last time he'll get to interact with all four girls. He's got to think fast, otherwise he'll never find out who Apollo is so he attempts to impress them by claiming he knows a lot about voice acting. However, Nene ain't buying into his obvious lies. No, but it's true. He actually spent countless hours studying voice acting, so he can help Apollo achieve her dreams. Besides, their equipment is outdated, and he, as the son of one of the wealthiest families in Japan, can replace them with top-of-the-line audio equipment, so long as they let him join the broadcasting club. Uzuki agrees to his proposal while the other two girls remain hesitant. They seek Rika's opinion and yeah, she agrees to it, but only because she actually likes his voice. Now Uzuki suddenly shifts her tone and says she feels bad about taking advantage of Yamabuki's wealth. They want to thank him somehow, but considering his wealth, he can pretty much afford anything they can give him. So, what's a meaningful way to express their gratitude? Well... Rika suggests there's one thing he might want from them. She whispers it to Nene, which makes her scream. But they carry on with it. The girls instruct Yamabuki to turn around. And then, all four of them whisper, I love you, right into his ear canals. There's a particular ketchup squirting sound I'd like to insert here. Especially because you've been daring me for days. But this channel basically has one HP left, so I won't. Yamabuki bursts out of the broadcast room. He finds it difficult to believe that he finally found Apollo after all those years. 
though he's still not sure who among them she is. He recalls the time during one of Apollo's shows when it was just him and her and no one else. As per usual, Apollo finished the show by saying, I love you. That particular day, Yamabuki impulsively replied back, I love you. Thinking back on this cringe memory makes him recoil and shrivel up. How can a Yamabuki like himself make such a blunder? I mean, she could have recorded his voice, which means it could be used against him when he inherits his family's company. So time is of the essence and he must figure out Apollo's true identity. Meanwhile, let's go check out the girls again. They're still in the midst of a debate whether it was a good idea to let Yamabuki join their club. Nene is skeptical of Yamabuki's intentions, while Rika stands behind her support for his membership. Karino seems indifferent and thinks it doesn't hurt to have him around while we don't really get to hear how Uzuki feels. And look, you guys, more plots. Maybe I should have said 16 plots in the video's title, but I digress. By the way, Yamabuki wasn't the only one who found solace from Apollo. Apollo used to have barely any listeners tuning into her show, but she could always count on Yamabuki to be there for her. So she, too, found solace in listening to his voice. So while she feels bad that she can't reveal her identity yet, it felt good for her to finally hear his voice again, in real life this time. Yamabuki returns to the cafeteria in the nick of time, with minutes remaining before lunch break ends. Just then, his phone rings unexpectedly. He thinks it's his mom texting him, but holy sh**, it actually turns out to be Apollo's broadcast, which she hasn't done in years. It looks like they're throwing a little party to welcome Yamabuki. Yeah, he sure looks welcomed. He's never had such a warm welcoming in his life. It looks like he can hardly breathe. And as we dive into chapter two, Yamabuki offers to recap the story so far. But as I've made it clear in one of my recent videos, f*** off, bro, that's my job. Anyway, here I am getting jealous over a 2D character because Nene is treating him like absolute trash, just the way I like it. Nene thinks Yamabuki has zero potential in voice work, and indeed, he proves her right that he's an absolute garbo. Finally, Uzuki intervenes to restore peace. She informs Yamabuki that the club advisor is against having a boy in the club, so he's only allowed to do the chores. The VTuber aspiring Kirino jumps into the conversation and questions if he really wants to do broadcasting that badly. This prompts Yamabuki to recall his true motive for joining the club, identifying who Apollo is. Based on the clues she's given him so far from her surprise broadcast, she's definitely letting him know that she's in the broadcasting club. Yet she won't reveal who she exactly is. Is she merely toying with him? Time is of the essence. He must swiftly unveil Apollo's identity so he can eliminate the only evidence of his weakness. By the time Yamabuki comes back to reality, it's just him and Uzuki in the room. And that arch, though, you guys, if I could make the AI scream, you know I would. Anyway, she's going to be making the announcement alone, giving Yamabuki the opportunity to observe her more closely. If you forgot, Uzuki is the one who wants to become an announcer one day. She's also the vice president of the student council, and, as you might have noticed, she's got quite the cheery attitude, making her popular with both boys and girls. Bringing those two plots right up to our faces, Uzuki asks for his manly help in setting up for the broadcast. As he does, he discovers Uzuki's script, adorned with marks and notes. Impressed by her dedication, Yamabuki compliments her efforts. In response, she scooches over to him and asks him to repeat it in her ear. When he asks why, she confesses that she's a fan of his voice. Yamabuki recalls that's what Apollo once said to him as well. So could Uzuki possibly be Apollo? She's not giving it away that easily, though, so before he can ask her, Uzuki puts her finger on his lips to shush him, as the broadcast is about to begin. Putting all his focus on listening to Uzuki's school announcement, he tries to match her voice with Apollo's. Could it really be her? Is he with Apollo right now? Maybe not, because she's fumbling her words every few seconds. So Yamabuki decides to set aside his observation of Uzuki on hold for now and shift his focus to the other girls. Coincidentally, or just as the author intended, I guess, he comes across Nene. She's the one who trash talks our boy, aspires to become a voice actress, and also cosplays on the side. As soon as she spots Yamabuki, she redirects her fans' attention to him, alleging that he's been harassing her. 
just as he dismisses Nene that she couldn't possibly be Apollo. She begins reading aloud a scene from a manga. Not only did Apollo also love that particular manga, she read the very scene during her broadcast. So Yamabuki realizes he can't rule her out as a candidate. Anyway, Yamabuki decides to take a little break from his investigation. His mind is soon overtaken with a concern about the announcer aspiring Uzuki, but no, he should stay focused on identifying who Apollo is. It's been rather challenging, given that he's only heard Apollo's voice through a speaker. So he'll have to rely on observing how the girls act and what they say in order to determine which of them is really Apollo. And holy sh**, Kirino suddenly comes out of nowhere and repeats what Yamabuki just said aloud. He tumbles down the stairs, which is unfortunately how the manga ends. Never mind, you guys. There are more pages left. Kirino apologizes for getting too close. And while the author provides us with a bunch of details, I know that you don't really care. I bet your eyes are fixated on something else. Her necktie. Kirino is particularly popular among the otakus and is known for her quiet, cat-like demeanor. But what's she doing in the stairway by herself? Karino reveals that it's where she streams as a VTuber. When Yamabuki expresses a desire to watch her stream, Karino readily agrees. She acts completely different during her stream than her usual self. Even her voice sounds different, though it's not too far off from Apollo's. She ends the stream shortly after, prompting Yamabuki to question the brevity. Doesn't she need more practice to improve her speaking skills? However, Karino doesn't appear all that interested in improving her voice work. She seems content with the fact that her viewers are happy. With a sudden change of expression, Yamabuki takes his leave, leaving Karino to wonder whether she did or said something wrong. Having closely observed the girls, except for Rika, Yamabuki realizes the girls don't appear all that serious about their career aspirations. He's oddly emotional about it, though, as if he's starting to care about all four girls. Wasn't his goal simply to identify Apollo? Just as I'm beginning to wonder whether this manga is indeed going to turn out to be a harem, we get another flashback of Yamabuki's memory. He recalls a conversation with Apollo about her aspirations in voice work. At the time, Yamabuki promised to help Apollo pursue her passion, and they promised to each other that they'd support each other in becoming professionals in the industry. Perhaps that's why Yamabuki is feeling upset, because if Apollo is really one of the broadcast club members, that means she wasn't all that serious about their shared promise. Or maybe she's just forgotten about it. Interrupting his thoughts, a couple of the side characters call for Yamabuki to return to class together. They manage to earn a small panel for themselves, but Yamabuki immediately reminds them of their insignificance by claiming he's gotta go do some main character sh**. While the girls are making school announcements, Yamabuki bursts through the door. He shouts his name for no reason and asks whether the girls are happy with the current state of affairs. The girls get shocked, and so do the rest of the students who are tuning in through the classroom speakers. They silently gesture at him to leave, but Yamabuki has had enough. As a descendant of the esteemed Yamabuki family, he refuses to tolerate mediocrity in his presence, especially among his fellow club members. So he boldly makes an announcement to the entire school that he will bring perfection to the broadcasting club. He's going to carry the team and make the girls all accomplish their dreams, whether they want it or not. This, Yamabuki believes, is his way of keeping the promise to Apollo, even if she has forgotten about it. And since he doesn't know which of the four girls is Apollo yet, he's just going to have to make all their dreams come true. That was super cool, Yamabuki thinks to himself. Nope. His dumbass gets fired and yeeted out of the club room. For making a huge scene in front of the entire school, the girls get a scolding from a bald teacher. Scratch that, he's got some hair left. Anyway, what we do know at this point is that one of the girls is definitely Apollo. The following morning, at the ungodly hour of 6 a.m., Yamabuki dons Squirtle's sunglasses and takes the girls out for a morning run. If this was an anime, we'd get to see all eight plots bounce rhythmically right now. But alas, we'll just have to rely on our imagination. After the run, they decide to take a break. And I personally have never been this angry at a speech bubble. Rika approaches Yamabuki and questions why he's so invested in them. Does he perhaps have an ulterior motive? How can they really trust him? 
Yo, I swear to God my intentions are nobler than all of Queen Elizabeth's children, Yamabuki claims. Anyway, he suggests heading to get breakfast. But the girls remain hesitant and distance themselves from Yamabuki. He thinks they're trying to escape, so he chases after them, which is when Nene finally goes on a rage-filled explanation that they're too sweaty so they ought to get changed first. So if there's another isekai manga I'd like to be the main character of, I'd like it to be called That Time I Got Reincarnated as a Washing Machine at a Coin Laundry by the Seashore. We find ourselves at a restaurant, and it looks like the girls have changed. Nothing enrages me more when the manga skips over such a pivotal scene, but let's move on. Yamabuki throws down a stack of papers, revealing that he has prepared individual booklets with training programs tailored to each person's shortcomings. He's identified the following goals. Kirino, the VTuber wannabe, has to audition for an agency. Uzuki, the aspiring announcer, needs to take an introductory announcer course. Nene, who wants to become a voice actress, needs to pass a language test. And for Rika, she needs to sell 50 copies of her music album at a street performance. There's silence at first. Rika questions whether he's considered how difficult her task is for her to perform live in front of a crowd while playing an instrument. Yamabuki is relentless, however, and urges them to just, just do, it. do it. Rika questions whether he's ever been nervous. Nope, he's a Yamabuki, so he's never experienced such beta feelings reserved for peasants. In response, Rika slaps his cheeks, gets up real close, and calls him a big fat liar. She then walks away, declaring that she has no intention of following his orders. As Uzuki points out, she might really be angry this time. He's never really seen her angry before. She's been all smiles since they first met. Come to think of it, Yamabuki realizes she seems to be avoiding him lately. Nene interjects to provide Yamabuki a reality check that there's no point for Rika to follow the advice of some clueless idiot who spits a bunch of nonsense. Being a Yamabuki, no one's ever dared to speak to him that way, except for maybe his older sister, younger sister, and his mother pretty much everyone in his family. That said, he'll be the one to assess how good Rika is. Yamabuki then excuses himself, given that the time of the day is approaching for him to launch his missile. Apparently, it's well known at the school that Rika performs live in the school's courtyard every Wednesday after school. So, Yamabuki goes to check it out for the first time. Turns out, basically, the entire school is there to attend her live performance, as Rika begins to sing, memories of Apollo flood back into Yamabuki's mind, as if he's reliving the moment right then and there. Her performance leaves him speechless. Not only was her performance impressive, it felt as though he saw a glimpse of Apollo. In the ensuing weeks, Rika notices Yamabuki showing up every week to catch her live performances. Surprisingly, she doesn't appreciate it. In fact, she doesn't want him to listen to any of her songs for some reason. One day, after yet another successful performance, Rika crosses paths with Yamabuki. She teasingly questions if he's crushing over her, seeing that he's been showing up every week. To her surprise, he readily acknowledges her talent and apologizes for underestimating her. However, Rika doesn't give in so easily to his flattery and walks away from him. Over the next few weeks, Rika continues her Wednesday performances. Yet Yamabuki is nowhere to be seen. He doesn't show up at her performances or the broadcast club. So she figures she might have been too harsh and that she ought to apologize the next time she sees him. That happens to be the very next moment because Yamabuki is up on stage with a guitar and the crowd is booing him to get off the stage. Spotting Rika, he declares that he's not all talk and reveals that he's been practicing playing the guitar and singing just to surprise her. Rika gets taken aback. He seems to be telling the truth as evidenced by his blistered fingers, so she decides to cover for him. Addressing the crowd, she announces that he's there to perform with her. Their duet kind of sucks because Yamabuki still sucks at the guitar. She figures he must have been nervous, which Yamabuki denies again. As he mentioned before, he doesn't even know the meaning of the word. In response, Rika puts her head against his chest to listen to his thumping heartbeat. Then she calls him a big fat liar again, which makes my big fat, heart, pound, as well. 
The broadcast club members are all gathered on another school day. Like she has been lately, Nene excuses herself out early, claiming she's got things to do. She won't say exactly what it is, though, and straight up ignores our boy when he reminds her of her goal. Well, more like his goal for her, but that's beside the point. The other girls are left wondering what Nene is up to, but none of them know exactly. Yamabuki also suspects she's up to no good. But Uzuki, ever the peacemaker, stands up for Nene. Besides, she claims that it's easy to tell when Nene is lying. So here is Nene on her way out of the broadcast room, immediately greeted by her classmates. Or more like fans, I should say. As she hurriedly excuses herself, Yamabuki deftly pursues her like a ninja into an empty classroom. He catches a glimpse of that thick notebook with the word audition written on it. Unaware of Yamabuki's presence, Nene begins practicing her lines. Despite the nostalgic comfort of her soothing voice to Yamabuki, he can't resist bursting into the classroom to offer constructive criticism. According to him, her performance lacks emotional depth. Nene retaliates by ungratefully chucking a manga at him so hard that it becomes a part of his forehead. Just before, she was practicing the scene where the princess secretly kisses the knight through his helmet. Anyway, it's none of his business, so Nene tells Yamabuki to scram. Undeterred, Yamabuki refuses to do so, because he's as invested in her goals as she is. Seeing her reluctance to open up to him, Yamabuki decides to share a few embarrassing secrets, like the time he wet the sheets by accident during a school field trip. Having revealed his own embarrassing moments, Yamabuki seeks Nene's honesty in return. Finally, Nene confesses that she's struggling with her acting because she doesn't have any experience in dating. That's when Yamabuki gets inspired with a brilliant idea. He kneels down and asks her to go out with him. She screams in typical anime style and begins blushing madly. Well, Yamabuki actually just rickrolled her because he was simply reenacting a scene directly from the play. Anyway, here's the plan. Starting that day, Yamabuki's going to act as the knight and she'll be the princess. There are three weeks left until the audition, so until then, they're going to be dating and reenacting every scene from the play. Nene attempts at a futile refusal, but she simply can't deny the Riz Master's magnetism. So they soon show up in front of everyone, hand in hand, not only enraging their classmates, but me as well. As I write this, I'm harboring an unhealthy amount of jealousy toward these two D characters. Anyway, Yamabuki smoothly delivers another line from the play, making her stutter like a jazz improvisation. She tries to get a hold of herself, but Yamabuki is relentless. He takes her by the hand and shoots another line from the manga. That's when Nene realizes Yamabuki has memorized the entire script. He seems to be reenacting each line from the beginning, which means at the end of the third week, they're going to be kissing for real. Oh my god, she can't believe it, but just in case, let me chap my lips real quick. Over the next several days, Yamabuki remains in character, faithfully reenacting every scene from the manga. We're on day 19, which means there are only two days left until the kiss scene. The other girls take notice of the two, who seem like a real couple at this point. They're also arguing more, which is a testament to the fact that they're growing closer. The day before the audition, Yamabuki asks Nene if she feels prepared. In response, she turns around and gives him attitude. In reality, though, she's turned around to hide her reddened cheeks. Because there's still one scene she hasn't practiced with Yamabuki, and that's the kiss scene. Oh my god, just the anticipation alone makes her go on another blush fest. Wait a minute. Was this Yamabuki's plan all along? Maybe his coaching was just an excuse to get cultural. She turns back around to raise her suspicions, but upon seeing how engrossed he is in the manga, she gets fully convinced that Yamabuki's motives are to help her and more innocent than a newborn's chuckle. So she puckers up because it's time to get cultural. But Yamabuki isn't about to jeopardize the sanctity of this channel, so he ushers her to take a break before her real audition. Nene gets shook and asks about the kiss scene. However, Yamabuki tells her that she ought to save her kiss for someone she truly loves. Nene storms off feeling a mix of anger and embarrassment. As she makes her way out, Yamabuki wishes her good luck and expresses his belief in her. Just before leaving the classroom, Nene reluctantly admits that the past three weeks were fun. 
Just a little bit. Yeah, she totally bombs the audition. Yamabuki falls in utter shock over the news. Well, actually, it turns out that the role was already reserved for someone else, so it's not really Nene's fault. Seeing Yamabuki's disappointment, she resolves to cheer him up by reenacting the final scene of the play. So while his vision is obstructed by the book, reminiscent of the knight's helmet in the play, Nene kneels down and... Does he not realize what she just did? Like all those dense manga characters that I just want to slap the shit out of? Nope. Yamabuki grabs her hand before she can leave and directly confronts her about it. In fact, he straight up asks if Nene is in love with him. After all, he explicitly told her to save her kiss for someone she truly loves, yet she kissed him. After reducing Yamabuki to a pulp, Nene storms out of the classroom. The other girls rush in to discover Yamabuki barely holding on to his life, right on the cusp of being isekai to another manga. He's convinced Nene hates her, but Uzuki thinks otherwise. Knowing Nene, she was probably just embarrassed. Besides, Nene is a terrible liar, and it's pretty obvious when she's lying. In case you guys were too focused on the plots and missed it entirely, Uzuki is referring to Nene's ears. Her ears give it away when she's lying. Before we move on to the next chapter, the story shifts briefly to Apollo's perspective, two years ahead in the timeline. Apollo reminisces about her shared moments with Yamabuki when he was still unaware of her true identity. I still have no idea who it is, but if you have an idea, feel free to share them in the comments. On another ordinary day, Yamabuki makes his way to the broadcast club room as usual, but when he opens the door, he's greeted by all eight of the manga's plots simultaneously. His surprised reaction goes to show you just how thick and heavy the plots are. And rightfully so, he gets angry at the girls for putting this channel in great jeopardy. If just one of their plots got leaked, it would have been trouble for all of us because this channel can't afford any spoilers. Anyway, the rest of the day goes by rather uneventfully and the girls decide to hang out after school. They invite that lucky bastard Yamabuki to join them, but he declines their heavenly offer, citing other commitments. So he leaves, leaving the plots, I mean the girls, by themselves. Immediately, Nene suggests they should follow and get some dirt on him. He just saw theirs, so it's only fair that they get something to leverage against him. While Rika doesn't appear all that bothered that he caught a glimpse, they decide in the end to go on an expedition to expose Private Yamabuki's own plot which is deceivingly small at first, but grows to become quite significant. There he is, slowly making his way somewhere. And here are the girls. I had to look real careful to make sure nothing needed to be blurred out, and I swear that's the only reason I looked for a solid two minutes. Anyway, Yamabuki enters a cafe by himself, puzzling the girls further as to what he's up to. So they follow him into the cafe, only to be greeted by the waiter who is none other than Yamabuki himself. The girls deftly avoid making eye contact so he doesn't realize who they are. They begin whispering among themselves, speculating on why a rich kid like Yamabuki would be working at a cafe of all places. Could he have been lying about his identity all this time? Is he actually just a brokey? Coincidentally, the girls overhear Yamabuki chatting with the manager about the very topic. When the manager asks why he's working so much despite his family's wealth, Yamabuki clarifies that it's his father who's rich, while he's just a high school student. Besides, he doesn't want to rely on anybody else but himself. In response, the nosy manager asks what he needs the money for. Yamabuki explains that he needs it to buy audio equipment for his club, fulfilling the promise he made to the girls when he first joined. His manager gets even nosier and points out that the amount of money for the equipment might be too much for a high school student to afford on his own. Yamabuki admits that buying all that equipment is probably overkill. Besides, the girls kind of disappointed him at first with their lack of effort and interest in their own goals. That said, they're beginning to show real progress, and Yamabuki says he sees real potential in all four of them. The manager suspects that Yamabuki isn't satisfied with a regular rom-com, and that he's aiming to turn this manga into a harem. Yamabuki gets triggered by the accuracy of this accusation, but is interrupted by the girls who'd like to make an order. Finally noticing their presence, Yamabuki breaks out into an unhealthy amount of sweat. 
While Nene teases him about his cute outfit, something in the expression of one of the girls is off, but it's not clear who. The next day, we find Yamabuki sitting alone in the broadcast room, still sweating about the day before and how his part-time gig got exposed to Apollo. Apparently, their high school doesn't allow students to have jobs, but that's not what's important because Kirino suddenly comes in. Yamabuki is convinced she's here to expose his secret. But no, that's not why she's here. Since she's got to see something embarrassing about him, she offers to show him something embarrassing about herself in return. And without further explanation, she locks the door behind her and starts walking towards him. She then begins to unhood her hood and unzip her zip. Oh my god, what in the world is happening, you guys? Let's all unzip together and get ready for this scene. Oh shit, never mind, put it back in, you guys. She's just here to ask for some streaming advice from Yamabuki. You see, her viewers are starting to lose interest in her, and she doesn't know what to do about it. When Yamabuki suggests she needs to switch things up, Kirino claims she does all sorts of things, like singing, gameplay, chatting, cooking. You guys are reading the speech bubbles and not distracted by something else, right? Like the curvature of that necktie, perhaps. Anyway, it's not her content that's the issue. Yamabuki claims to know exactly what's wrong as he's watched every single one of her streams, which gets Kirino all flustered. Anyway, he turns on several of her streams randomly and points out the obvious flaw. All her expressions are exactly alike. You might as well have a still image for an avatar instead of calling yourself a VTuber. Kirino herself is well aware of the issue, but those fancier avatars with facial expression tracking costs a lot of money, something she can't afford at the moment. Of course, this is Yamabuki we're talking about, so he's got a plan to address that. A few days later, Yamabuki excitedly bursts through the door to unveil a new avatar for Kirino. At first glance, it looks pretty much identical. But no, now the avatar can track her facial expressions, so he gets Carino to test run the new avatar. It looks like it's working properly. The only problem is, she's stiffer than me in front of the mic, which is why I still haven't uploaded anything on my gaming channel. Anyhow, Yamabuki encourages her to be more expressive because that's what her simps, I mean her viewers, would want. But Carino gets all shy and claims she can't do it. Finally, Yamabuki resorts to tickling her sides, which just makes me feel more single than I've ever felt in my life. But what's even more soul-crushing is that the two end up stumbling together to the floor, and Karino gets all kawaii on him with a smile. Meanwhile, this is me while I writing the script. Inside. The other girls rush over upon hearing the commotion. Is she okay? No, she's not. Kirino tells on Yamabuki that he kicked off a cultural fest out of nowhere and pushed her onto the floor. Of course, she's just kidding. She's actually grateful for his help and says she'll try her best to convey her emotions in her next stream. But her next stream sucks even more, and Carino is more tense than ever. Meanwhile, her viewers are growing disappointed, thinking the avatar hasn't changed much, and accusing her of clickbaiting. While Carino remains frozen, Yamabuki devises a cunning plan. He writes smile on a piece of paper, but obviously that doesn't help at all. Well, he does have one other idea, but it's kind of out there. Feeling desperate, Carino pleads for his help. In response, Yamabuki walks behind her and hugs her from behind. Carino screams at his unexpected touch, while Yamabuki suddenly ends her stream. What in the hell was that? asks Carino. Yamabuki tells her to calm her ass down and listen to him. He explains that the pressure is getting to her, and evidently she's sweating too much from her nerves. In fact, he innocently suggests she should take off a few layers to help her cool down. While Carino calls him a perv, she complies, much to my surprise and happiness. Meanwhile, Yamabuki starts taunting her, claiming her outward portrayal of confidence is nothing but a facade and she's just a shy little girl on the inside. He then questions her dedication to her dream, suggesting she doesn't seem all that serious about it. Kirino gets visibly irked, but Yamabuki doesn't stop there and continues talking mad trash. Finally, Kirino has a raging fit, passionately claiming she is serious and trying her best. Overcoming your nerves isn't that simple. If it's so hard, why doesn't she quit? Because she loves streaming and doesn't ever want to give it up. Unrelenting, Yamauki asks what's so good about it. While Kirino starts rambling on about why she likes streaming, 
My favorite girl Uzuki comes out of nowhere to inform her that her stream audio was left on the entire time. Everything she said was witnessed by over 2,000 people. Karino has never had so many viewers at one time. What's more, the comments are all positive. Literally everyone is simping over how cute Karino is. So everything went according to Yamabuki's plan. He knew that if people could witness her true self, Kirino's popularity would soar. Having said that, she should end the stream now for real this time, and so she does, with a kawaii smile, making her simp simp even harder. And something else in my possession too, but I digress. After saving another day like the hero he is, Yamabuki heads to the bathroom for his daily self-care routine. But Kirino rudely interrupts his meditative moment by video calling him with her avatar. She thanks him for helping her out, realizing that he must have left the stream running on purpose. Karino also promises to keep trying her best, though it's still a bit nerve-wracking. In response, this is what Yamabuki says. The new avatar is nice and all, but her real smile is more kawaii than three baskets of newborn kitties. Kirino's response through her avatar is a blank stare. She doesn't move or even utter a single word back. While Yamabuki thinks she's triggered again, he's actually wrong. Karino's avatar isn't moving because she's hiding her reddened cheeks away from the camera. Looks like we've got two girls down, and if my math is correct, there are just two more to go. It appears my favorite girl, Uzuki, is next in line to be rizzed up by the Rizmaster. We find Uzuki in the middle of a student council meeting. As the vice president, she's chairing the committee to organize the upcoming sports day. And given that it's their school's first sports day after the girls-only school merged with the boys-only school, they're committed to making sure everything goes smoothly. Now I bet you guys weren't even paying attention to what I was saying, or even reading the speech bubbles, right? Yeah, me too. I had to rewrite this script three times because my eyes were just fixated on that necktie, because there's nothing more I love than neckties. Here's another shot of her, and Lord have mercy on my left hand, for I have sinned. At this point, I don't even care what's being discussed at the committee meeting. All I know is that there's a sports day coming up in the next few chapters, and that Uzuki is now my favorite 2D girl. Like me, everyone else at school seems to be fanning over her too. She's kawaii, smart, and even her voice is nice. Though I'd like to keep being a simplord, we're rudely interrupted by a couple of lazily drawn side characters who ask Uzuki's help to fix their mistake. Can she fix it? Can she fix it? Sorry, I got a little nostalgic. Anyway, the side characters express their gratitude, and while Uzuki reciprocates with a smile, she realizes she'll end up staying at school until the evening with their request. But Uzuki thinks that maybe she can ask the broadcasting club members for help? Alas, she's the type of person who can't turn down a request but also struggles to ask for help. In fact, she takes on even more roles for the upcoming sports day, volunteering to be the contact, scorekeeper, and scheduler. When Rika checks with Uzuki to make sure she's okay with taking on all the responsibilities, she of course reassures that everything is daijobu. But it's not over just yet. Yamabuki suggests they organize their own event too. Uzuki automatically chimes in with her support. All sorts of ideas come up like a maid cafe, starting a newsletter, Maid Cafe, renting out the club room, Maid Cafe. Frankly, that's the only one I care about. It better fucking be a Maid Cafe. Anyway, Uzuki can't stop herself, but Donna smile while volunteering to compile everyone's ideas and put together a plan. With that settled, everyone heads home. Everyone but Uzuki who stays behind to get started on all the tasks she's taken on. Rika is the only one who turns to ask if Uzuki needs any help. But given her personality, she simply can't accept it. Yamabuki, however, comes out of nowhere. He doesn't say a single word, but suddenly books it down the hallway, leaving Uzuki puzzled and a little scared. He then dashes back, having made sure the girls are out of earshot. Finally, Yamabuki takes Uzuki to a secluded spot in the school stairway and pins her against the wall. He then leans forward and asks her to swear to keep her silence about what he's about to do to her. Our sly dog surprises her with a cough drop. Having noticed that she sounded different today, as if she has a cold, he's brought a cough candy for her. He was only being secretive because it's against the school rules to bring any snacks, which include cough drops. Uzuki gets deeply moved by Yamabuki's consideration. 
He admits to having noticed by observing her and listening to her voice at every moment. That unexpected confession makes Uzuki all fidgety. Anyway, Yamabuki advises her not to overburden herself and that she should learn to rely on others as well. Uzuki acknowledges such a tendency of hers because that's how she's always been. She supposes it comes from a place of insecurity and a yearning for affirmation from others. Feeling a bit embarrassed for revealing so much about herself, Uzuki then tries to brush off the conversation. Yamabuki teases her about wanting all the glory for herself. She's crafted an image of excellence in every aspect of her life, leading others to expect nothing less of her. That must have been a lot of pressure for her, but there's no need to worry anymore. Now that he, someone much greater and capable than her, has arrived at her school, everyone's expectations will shift onto him. So she can relax because he'll take the burden on from now. In fact, she can rely on him too, because his potential and capacity are limitless. As a parting note, Yamabuki suggests she should unwind and let herself go. Then he turns around like a G to leave Uzuki fidgeting all by herself. But in a surprise turn of events, Uzuki suddenly reaches for his hand to prevent his leave. Does she want more cough drops from him? No, it's not more cough drops she's after. She proposes that they both let loose right now. Just what in the Jurassic world is going on? Before Yamabuki can ask about her intentions, Uzuki urges him to shut his eyes. He complies, but then immediately opens his eyes out of distrust to catch Uzuki doing this. The chocolate near his mouth somehow causes him to suspend all the laws of physics and hurl backward. And as you might have expected, we've been rickrolled again by the manga's author. Uzuki was simply trying to sneak a piece of chocolate into Yamabuki's mouth. And here I was, hoping for a toe, at least. Anyway, Uzuki confesses that snacking is how she relieves her own stress. That's why she has a mountain of snacks with her at all times. So Uzuki entices Yamabuki with another snack, but he outright refuses, even when she starts brushing his teeth with it. Man, I wish it was the other way around with Yamabuki's snack in her mouth. But anyhow, let's get back to business, shall we? After all, Uzuki has a lot of things to do. So Yamabuki offers to assist with her tasks. Being a top G, he's more than capable of handling most of her workload. At this point, Uzuki simply can't get enough of Yamabuki. Meanwhile, he suggests to Uzuki that she ought to rely on others and express herself more openly, at least with the broadcasting club members. However, Uzuki says she's satisfied playing the supportive role as a side character of this manga. The other three girls are so talented that Uzuki would rather focus on helping them shine brighter, even before her own aspirations. Besides, they need her help, and sports day would end up in a disaster like last year if she doesn't step up. Oh, and by the way, Uzuki suddenly informs him that she intends to leave the club soon. Wait, what? But that means I'd have to change the title of this video. Is she transferring to another school or something? No, she just wants to focus on her studies so she can get into a good college, graduate with a liberal arts degree, and end up working at Starbucks. Yamabuki gets enraged over her minimum wage earning aspirations. He simply won't tolerate mediocrity in his presence. No, sir. She must make all her dreams come true and also stay in the club. Despite Uzuki's resistance, her efforts are obviously futile because Yamabuki is bent on carrying her ass over the finish line, whether she wants it or not. He's absolutely committed to her success and that's non-negotiable. Uzuki is puzzled by his unwavering support. Why is he willing to go to such lengths for her? Because this manga wouldn't be a proper harem without you. In all seriousness, though, it's because Yamabuki finds her to be just as talented and radiant as the other three girls. Uzuki's cheeks flush red, and so does her face. Does he really think she's good enough? Indeed, he does. So Yamabuki asks again about what it is she wants to do for sports day. Uzuki finally admits to having an event idea for sports day and that she'll propose it to the rest of the club members. She then requests Yamabuki to keep their conversation a secret. Not the fact that she's secretly a snack-ingesting machine, but about her insecurities and that she considered leaving the club. In response, Yamabuki grabs a handful of her snacks and starts stuffing his cheeks until he reaches that lil dangly thing that swing in the back of his throat. Then he looks back like a G and says they're partners in crime now. Later, once the members all gather, Uzuki presents her idea of holding a confession service at sports day. 
To her surprise, the girls all enthusiastically agree to her idea, prompting Uzuki to sneak a kawaii glance over to Yamabuki. At this point, I think it's safe to say Yamabuki has conquered three out of four, wouldn't you say? And holy shit, you guys. Guess what? It's sports day. I'm doing backflips as I write this because it's just so exciting. And just look at Yamabuki go. He's just beat everyone in the racing event, even all the guys in the school's running club. He's finished so quickly that he's able to rush over to the commentary booth and comment on the ongoing race for the rest of the runners. Meanwhile, it looks like Rika is making announcements for sports day alone in the club room. But soon, Carino shows up to remind Rika that she's got to hurry up and join the scavenger hunt. The race commences, and just look at them go, you guys. They sure can bounce. I mean run. Carino and Rika both make it to the table to receive their missions. Carino's task is to find the person who she relies on the most, while Rika's is to find the person whose voice she likes the most. Without hesitation, the girls both run over to Yamabuki, and, Lord forgive me for you know that I'd Hulk smash that without a moment of hesitation. I mean, have you guys seen better ones in any other manga or anime? I think this calls for a scholarly debate in the comment section. Anyway, the three of them hold hands and dash to finish the race, but they're simply too slow running this way, so Yamabuki decides to literally carry them both. There's no way that you can run faster this way, but let's let this one slide and move on. As soon as the race ends, Kirino gets curious over what was written on Rika's paper. While they refuse to show each other's, oh yeah, Yamabuki runs over to the other panel in order to participate in the next event. There seems to be a holdup, though, because of a couple students getting injured during the cavalry battle event. But frankly, Yamabuki couldn't give any less of a fuck about those two side characters, even if they can never walk again. So he serves as their replacement and hoists Uzuki onto his shoulder. Uzuki gets all shy and sweaty about it, which makes me jealous over just how warm Yamabuki's nape must be feeling. Anyway, guess who's on the opposing team? It's Nene. They're playing a game where the rider on top needs to take the opponent's headband. That's the reason Yamabuki gets up and close to Nene. Of course, what else do you expect but that to make her feel shy? It reminds her of their kiss the other day. Before she can mention it, though, Uzuki gets her headband taken like a fool, so the game just ends. Despite winning the game, Nene gets annoyed by how close Yamabuki and Uzuki seem to have gotten lately. Catching herself coveting, she tries to regain her composure, reminding herself that it's really none of her business. Eventually, all the sports events come to an end and it's lunchtime, so the broadcast members quickly gather to prepare for their confession service event. Here's how it's going to go down. They're going to put a string telephone by the door. Some of you guys might be too young to know, but this is what the first generation of the iPhone looked like. Anyway, students can come and whisper their confession into the cup, which the members can then broadcast to the school on their behalf, all while keeping their identity a secret. However, this event isn't officially part of the school's sports day, so the teachers can't know about it. And since they can't simply make an announcement about the event through the school's broadcast system, Uzuki's prepared posters to advertise the event. Just as they get all hyped up about their cunning plan, someone shows up at the door. Oh, shit. It's Lemon Chan, the broadcasting club's advisor. And let me interrupt for one quick second to ask you, what is this? That's right, it's Smash. I used to love playing this game, but what if the game card was made out of wood? I guess you'd have to call it Wood Smash, right? That's what I'd do to Lemon Chan, you guys. I... that citrus hole. Anyway, Lemon Chan ends up discovering their secret event. The girls ask for her agreement in keeping it a secret, but Lemon Chan flat out refuses. You see, she doesn't want to get in any unnecessary trouble. So Yamabuki comes up with a delectable offer she simply can't refuse. The problem is, Lemon doesn't even hear him out and instead kicks him out of the club. Finally, Uzuki swoops in to seek Lemon's blessing. Initially, Lemon declines, until Uzuki subtly reminds Lemon about her approval rating at school. If she were to help organize the event, she'd probably become the most popular teacher in school. That finally convinces Lemon to grant them permission. In fact, she offers her help in organizing the event. There's still one problem left, however. If you're curious, take a look yourself. A soulless demon walks outside with a megaphone, 
keeping his eye out on any miscreants. In order to distribute flyers in the vicinity of that demon, you're going to need at least three Hashiras. And I know what you're thinking. But Mada, this manga doesn't even have a single Hashira. Don't you worry, guys, because Lemon Chan has a plan. So let's go, gang. It's time for Operation Lemon. Here's the upper-ranked demon, spitting threats at the students to make sure they feel safe and protected at school. And here comes Lemon Chan, donning a kawaii smile, enticingly suggesting they should take a little break together. Having successfully charmed the demon, Lemon turns back and winks, or tries to at least to signal for the gang to commence with step number two of Operation Lemon. The gang starts distributing flyers and manages to generate some excitement. However, there's simply too many people and too little time to get to everyone. So the gang regroups, no, not you, Yamabuki, and they devise an even more cunning plan. Rika is initially hesitant, but you already know it's going to happen, so let's skip right to it. Here they are and f you guys. All the students go wild over their surprise cosplay. And notice how elongated this guy's head is? Yeah, mine too. But I'm not talking about the head attached to my neck. Okay, so advertising the event goes by successfully, just in the nick of time as Lemon Chan returns from being chased by the upper-ranked demon. Thankfully, she's still alive, so they all hurry back to the club room. Here's how the confession booth will work. Uzuki is going to listen to the confessions and broadcast them herself. Meanwhile, the other members will wait in the room next door and pretty much do nothing. So here we go, girls. Let's do this. Yeah. Oh my god, here comes the first side character to make a confession. She whispers her irrelevant confession into the cup. Afterwards, Uzuki repeats her confession over the school's broadcast system. The girl confesses her love to a boy at school, that she's always been in love with him. She asks for him to stand up if he accepts her confession. The boy does, and is immediately met by loud and excited cheers from his classmates. Even the teachers appear amused by the unexpected announcement. And all thanks to Lemon Chan, the demon remains distracted and yet unaware. As more and more students make their confessions through Zuki, Kirino becomes curious whether Rika or Nene have something or someone to confess to as well. Her questioning sparks a blush fest. But of course, these girls start making up excuses and claim they just want to apologize to someone about their recent mistakes. Even Kirino joins in and gets all sweaty over Yamabuki. All I'm thinking right now is that these assholes better be all Apollo, because if they're just simping over Yamabuki, I swear to God I'm gonna figure out how to make this AI scream and make it do so for the next 10 minutes. Anyway, Uzuki suddenly stops broadcasting without any explanation, so Yamabuki rushes over to find out what's going on. Oh shoot, it looks like the broadcast equipment broke down and Uzuki has no idea how to fix it. Uzuki starts breaking down as well, feeling useless and on the verge of tears. When the other girls burst in the room to ask if she's okay, the floodgates open and Uzuki finally starts bawling. Oh no, what do they do? They can't put the event on hold since the lunch break is ending soon. If only there was a competent G who can manhandle this sticky situation and save the event. There's not enough time to fix the audio equipment, so he's brought along a megaphone, which he managed to steal from the upper-ranked demon. His sheer competency fills Uzuki with such excitement that she impulsively lunges after Sir Yamabuki to embrace him tightly, not giving two shits that the other girls are watching. Meanwhile, Yamabuki reminds her that they're partners in crime, and they should get back to business. Equipped with the megaphone, Uzuki proceeds to share another side character's inconsequential confession that we'll never hear about again in this manga. The excitement among the crowd resumes, and Uzuki eagerly rushes over to hear the next confession. Judging by the expression on her face, it must finally be a confession from someone that matters. So let's get right to hearing what it is. Uzuki informs the crowd that this will be the last confession because we're not interested in any more confessions from the side characters. By the way, I don't have to bother mentioning that I would, right? As Uzuki begins relaying the confession through the megaphone, Yamabuki realizes it's from Apollo. Apollo admits to ghosting him three years ago. Her reason? She didn't feel like she had a right to speak to him any longer. 
She also says she didn't have any confidence in keeping her promise with him. But hearing his voice again, and him repeating the same promise back to her after all those years, it motivated her to reciprocate with the words she once spoke to him. I love you. Yamabuki, like the rest of the crowd, remains silent and motionless. As soon as Uzuki declares the event's conclusion and steps away from the window, a wave of excited gossip erupts among the side characters. Meanwhile, Yamabuki is deep in contemplation, deeper than the remains of Ocean Gate's submarine. He always thought of Apollo's confession at the end of her show as merely scripted. She's never said it while addressing him directly, until now that is. Determined, Yamabuki runs off to finally get to the bottom of Apollo, I mean who Apollo is. Is it one of these girls? Or could it perhaps be Uzuki? That's who Yamabuki runs towards. He grabs her to prevent her escape and asks who made the confession. And while those buttons are hanging on for the dear life of this channel, Uzuki vehemently denies any knowledge of who made the confession or that it's from her. But she's trembling like crazy. Is it because she's lying? Or was it from the pressure of standing before a big crowd? Anyhow, him trying to find Apollo's identity would go against the intention of the confession service. So he lets it go and apologizes to Uzuki. He also praises her for organizing a successful event. His acknowledgement, and maybe from the pent-up emotions from the pressure of the event, causes Uzuki to break down in tears. She can't thank him enough. But they're in the middle of the school's hallway, so if she really wants to thank him properly, Yamabuki suggests they should go somewhere more discreet. But no, Uzuki just hugs him on the spot because she could care less about what others think. Besides, they're partners in crime, right? Whatever that means. Sometime later, Yamabuki returns the megaphone to the upper-ranked demon. He gets held up getting his ass beat for stealing it. On his way back to help with the cleanup, his phone rings with that familiar tone. No, I'm kidding you guys. It's Apollo's broadcast, informing him that she's waiting for him right now in the club room. When Yamabuki arrives at the club room, there's already an iPhone one waiting for him. He puts it to his ear and hears Apollo's voice on the other end. It's been three years since they last spoke directly. Why did she choose to confess to him now? Yamabuki asks. Apollo doesn't provide him much of an answer other than that she felt sick of hiding. If that's the case, why doesn't she just reveal herself now and get it over with? While Yamabuki follows up by saying he was joking, it looks like Apollo is really considering it. Indeed, she really offers to reveal herself. That's in fact why she's asked him to come meet her in the first place. So does he want to see her face? I sure do, but this motherfucker says no. Probably because that'd mean the end of this manga. Even if it were to continue, the manga would no longer be a harem and Yamabuki is a greedy boy. So he passes on her offer, determined to figure out who she is on his own. And he's going to do it while making all the other girls' dreams come true, just as he promised. He wants to smash, I mean work together with her. He'll make it happen whether she wants it or not. That sounds like either a threat or a promise, depending on how you take it. But it seems like Apollo is at least amused by what he said. She asks Yamabuki to close his eyes, and when he does, she kachaks the door open and walks out of the room. While Yamabuki's eyes remain shut, Apollo whispers in his ear that she'll cherish his words. As she walks away, Yamabuki says he's got something to say. With reddened cheeks, wink, he confesses that he's been a fan of hers for a long time. He remains one even to this day, and he's happy to have been able to hear her voice again. Here we are with Lemon Chan at the post-sports day celebration party, which I didn't know could be a thing, but yay anyway. And the girls are here too, finally in regular clothes and not their school uniform. So cheers everyone, including the luckiest bastard in the history of manga. By the way, did you guys notice just how overdressed these girls are? It's no wonder Yamabuki didn't want Apollo to reveal her identity. I mean, at this point, who cares about Apollo's identity? Let's just help prevent the falling birth rate in Japan by starting to repopulate the country right now. You should join too, Lemon. But these girls won't admit it. They come up with all sorts of excuses why they're dressed so kawaii. Except for Rika. She straight up admits she's dressed to impress Yamabuki, 
and make him use one of Metapod's only skills. Harden. Did you hear that, Yamabuki? No, he's fast asleep. Faster than Truck Coon's delivery service to another realm. So Lemon Chan proposes that they make this a girls only party. They come up with the idea to go out and each come back with a snack. So they all leave, leaving Yamabuki alone in Lemon Chan's bed. About 15 minutes later, the door kachaks and someone approaches Yamabuki. Is it the demon? There's something they want to ask of him. Oh, it's Karino, the VTuber. She quietly asks why Uzuki hugged him earlier that day. They seem to be getting close. Are they perhaps already going out? Wait, you guys, here comes another one. It's Nene who catches Karino in the midst of wondering aloud if Yamabuki and Uzuki have kissed already. And man, hers are pretty big too. Anyway, Karino seems unaware of Nene's presence. She starts inching closer and closer to Yamabuki's face, prompting Nene to finally interrupt and make her presence known. Nene herself isn't exactly sure why she interrupted Karino just now. It's as if she acted spontaneously to stop Karino from getting cultural with Yamabuki. After a bit of a small talk, Karino turns the conversation toward Nene, questioning if she has ever kissed anyone. She avoids answering her question at first, but eventually admits to having done so, quite recently in fact. Nene fires back with her own questioning, asking if Karino is in love with Yamabuki. Nene admits to having witnessed her just before, trying to get all cultural. Karino denies it profusely. Well, actually, she's not sure herself. She can't tell if she likes him or what. But what about her, though? No, Nene asserts her preference for Yuri Manga. But if she had to star in a straight rom-com, she supposes she'd choose Yamabuki as the other main character. Suddenly, the door kachaks open for the third time. Whose foot is that? It's Uzuki's. But where are the other girls? They're kindly hiding under the bed so we can hear Uzuki's thoughts out loud this time. Uzuki says she owes Yamabuki two apologies. The first is for hugging him without permission. But then she squeezes his hand right after so she's not really sorry, is she? Anyway, she also wants to apologize for lying to him. You see, there's something she didn't tell him before. It's about what she said during the confession service. The door of timely interruption is added again, though, kachaking for the fourth time. Uzuki panics and hides under the bed where she is greeted by two sneaky eavesdroppers. And I never thought I'd wish to be that booger I once flung under my bed. But if those three girls are squeezing themselves under my bed like that, I'd gladly be the protagonist of a manga called That Time I Got Reincarnated as the Old Booger Under My Bed. Anyway, it's Rika, obviously, who's shown up to find Yamabuki alone in Lemon's place. Well, since he's asleep and no one is around, she decides to get changed. She takes her shirt off to put on a jacket, which doesn't make much sense, but anyway, she then sits beside Yamabuki. Observing the roughness of his hands, she realizes he must still be practicing the guitar. Rika starts confessing that she's writing her own song, but thankfully, one of the girls sneezes to move on from this boring scene. When Yamabuki finally awakens from his slumber, he finds the girls sitting around a table looking rather gloomy. It so happens that they all ended up buying cake as snacks. Seeing how flustered they look, I guess they're curious whose cake Yamabuki prefers the most. I personally say nothing beats that, so she wins. Anyway, Yamabuki starts devouring their cakes and says four might not be enough. Does that mean he plans to devour lemons too and expand the harem franchise even more? I'm a supporter of that idea. But that, unfortunately, is not what we get. Instead, we move on to the next day and find ourselves at Rika's music performance. The scene appears to be no different than usual, crowded with a bunch of side characters. Except for this girl. She doesn't have any dots on her face like the others and is even drawn outside the panels. That has got to mean she's important. Have we ever met her before, though? And why does she look so pissed off? As soon as Rika notices her presence, she abruptly stops playing. In fact, she calls an end to her performance entirely right after, something she's never done before. Having noticed all this, Yamabuki approaches the mysterious girl, but she dismisses our boy as if he's just a side character with dots all over his face. It's only when he holds a balloon captive that she decides to answer him. Finally, Yamabuki gets to ask what was up with her during Rika's performance. The girl deflects the question and instead asks for his opinion on Rika's show. 
Yamabuki launches into a rant about how talented Rika is, while I'm just over here getting jealous over that guitar. I wish that was my guitar she's holding, though she probably won't need two hands to hold mine. Anyway, the angry girl disagrees with Yamabuki's assessment of Rika, branding her as mediocre at best. Upon further questioning about her relationship with Rika, though, the girl scurries away from the scene. This time, we're at a karaoke bar with Rika. It seems like she's alone, still troubled by her encounter with the girl we just met. Rika is at the karaoke to work on her new song, but she simply can't get herself to focus. And just then, the melon soda she never ordered arrives. Oh, shit, it's Yamabuki. And judging by the zesty way he's holding that cup, I think he's alluding to the sheer girth of what he's about to unveil. If we've got any mathematicians on this channel, maybe let us know in the comments about Yamabuki's circumference based on his grip. That wraps up the recap midway through chapter 17. Sadly, I can't do another part since there's only one more chapter left. But you guys know I'll soon be back with another manga recap. Until then, thanks for watching. Love you guys. Bye.